April 2023, Las Vegas, Nevada. CinemaCon is underway and a number of Hollywood stars, film industry professionals and entertainment journalists are in attendance. Among the lineup are the two lead performers of a rom-com on Sony Pictures' roster of upcoming releases. But little do they know that a media firestorm is about to be set ablaze. Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve. Before we proceed with the rest of today's presentation, I want to remind all of you tuning in that SAG-AFTRA and WGA are currently on strike. Donation links will be listed in the pinned comment of this video if you would like to help financially support the workers who are currently fighting for fair working terms and conditions and wages. SAG-AFTRA shared an article published by Variety stating that critics and entertainment journalists are still allowed to review and cover various works from the film and television industries, review new releases because reviews are a different form of coverage than the influence influencer promotion category of online media that has come under fire for their willingness and eagerness to cross picket lines. Having said that though, if anyone from SAG would like for me to modify what I publish during these strikes, I am more than happy to do so. But now, let's return to the main topic. I burn, I pine, I perish. Of course you do. Anyone But You is an upcoming romantic comedy starring Glenn Powell and Sidney Sweeney. I am not a drama channel. I'm not knocking the people on YouTube who run them. I just know that my blood pressure would not be able to handle doing all of that. It just sounds far too stressful and laborious to keep up with every dramatic occurrence in celebrity and internet pop culture. But I know I won't hear the end of it if I don't give a quick recap of what happened with CinemaCon and shortly thereafter before I get into why I want to talk about anyone but you. Glenn Powell and Sidney Sweeney attended CinemaCon along with director Will Gluck to promote anyone but you. Online spectators decided these two were chummier than they should be on the red carpet and things quickly escalated until the performers were accused of having an affair with each other despite being in long-term relationships with other people at the time. I'm not particularly concerned with this situation. This is the type of white nonsense I don't care about, and I will elaborate on why that is if you give me a moment. I'm not pretending to be too good to care about celebrities saying or doing things, but I personally have more fun catching celebrity stories like more or less any outlandish thing Ridley Scott said on his extended press tour a couple of years ago for The Last Duel and House of Gucci when they were being released back to back. So it's a, a very realistic film. It looks more realistic than Kingdom of Heaven or Robin Hood if we're talking about your... Uh, Sir, fuck you, order. fuck you, thank you very much. <laughs> fuck you, go fuck yourself. Go on. Sir, go on. I am being very fucking positive. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite genres of Hollywood celebrities is older radicals speaking without a filter. Besides marching and, and protesting, what else do you suggest? Homicide. Those are the types of disruptive antics I'm perfectly happy to tune in for. This is a smokeless garden. Disruption. <laughs> But none of the parties involved in this particular story have made any in-depth public statements that I'm aware of, alleging the type of harm or moral transgression that would make me consider forming a strong opinion about whatever it is that happened. The internet is all about illusions, girl. You know that. <gasps> I do know that. Therefore, based on that, my current stance about this so-called news story is that I don't know these people, it's not my problem and not my business. They can work out whatever has happened in private. I'm not defending anyone or any wrongdoings, but I'm simply removing myself from the train of thought that would suggest that I'm required to form an opinion about a situation I don't believe I know anything about. I'm more than capable of having ire for people who work in show business, but at this particular moment in time, a lot of that ire is largely reserved for people who are much higher up the corporate food chain than either one of these two performers. When this dramatic story was dominating the headlines, the first things to pique my interest were 
a couple of words. The first two words being rom-com. Find a nickel for every time I got in a fist fight during a chick flick. I don't know why Hollywood turned its back on the rom-com or why some people decided that they hated fun and romance happening simultaneously. I can't believe that you have had sex with the woman staying in my house. <gasps> he told you that? Maybe if people hadn't been brainwashed into thinking snarky, unfunny Joss Whedon quips were the peak of screenwriting, instead of celebrating sweet, earnest, emotional intimacy between fictional characters, we could have gotten out of this rom-com drought far sooner than this. But then my attention was pulled in another direction by two other words. Oh, but I don't know about you, but I feel like this is like, not only do we go for the hard R. <laughs> when was the last time you saw like a hard R? Stop, stop talking. But somehow in the midst of all of this white noise, something broke through to fully hook me on this concept. Let's look at the basic premise for anyone but you. Over a year after meeting for the first time and attempting a disastrous one night stand, late 20s singles, late 20s? You better get married soon. You, you starting to look old. Late 20s singles B and Ben are forced to coexist at their mutual friend's destination wedding in Australia. Despite the presence of their attractive exes, they ultimately discover that they are meant to be together loosely based on William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. Loosely based on William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing? And now you have my attention. For as long as the film medium has existed, stories dating back many centuries have been a source of creative inspiration to be adapted in this latest form of storytelling. But any young millennial who grew up watching Hollywood films is bound to have a particular appreciation for the modern literary adaptation. Before the wave of films I personally have in mind when I think back on this storytelling concept, there were a couple of animated films that could be argued as being a precursor to this trend at the peak of its momentum. In 1988, Oliver and Company was released as a loose adaptation based on the Charles Dickens novel, Oliver Twist. In 1994, The Lion King was released as a loose adaptation of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. In hindsight, these animated Disney films could be seen as acting as a primer for children who would grow into teenagers that would experience a golden age of modern literary adaptations, a significant number of which were in fact crafted to center teenage protagonists. Let's go through a list that's not necessarily comprehensive, but it is thorough since it's important to see just how prevalent these modern literary adaptations were. 1995, Clueless, an adaptation of Emma by Jane Austen, 1996, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Although this particular adaptation maintained the original older variation of the English language spoken in Shakespeare's play, it's still a modern adaptation insofar as the film's characters are shown to exist in the modern world as they travel in cars and fight with guns, whereas the original story had characters traveling on horseback and fighting with swords. 1999, She's All That, an adaptation of Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw. This play is also the source material for the musical My Fair Lady and the iconic and often referenced sitcom here on my channel, Selfie. I'm nobody's plus one. I'm VIP bitches. Bitches, it's just me. One bitch. 1999, Cruel Intentions, an adaptation of Les Liaisons Dangereux by French author Pierre Chaudelot de Laclos. 2000, Romeo Must Die is loosely related to William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. 2001, Get Over It, an adaptation of William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. 2001, Bridget Jones's Diary, an adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. 2001, A Knight's Tale was based on the story of the same name from Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. I know this one isn't technically a modern literary adaptation, but I still wanted to mention it anyway because it did blur the lines somewhat between classic and modern references by incorporating a contemporary soundtrack into a period setting. <laughs> We will rock you. 
2001, Baz Luhrmann's Moulin Rouge, though bafflingly said on Wikipedia to be an adaptation of Giacomo Puccini's La Boheme, it's far more so aligned with the story of Giuseppe Verdi's La Traviata. Perhaps folks were getting confused because you're having these leading ladies of different operas coughing up blood into their delicate little handkerchiefs. Spoiler alert, a lot of operas have their leading women dying. Now, before any of you are wondering if I'm blurring things too much by including a film with story parallels to opera, I'll have you know that La Traviata was based on La Dame aux Camélias, a novel by Alexandre dumas -Fille. 2001, O was adapted from William Shakespeare's Othello. 2006, She's the Man was an adaptation of William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. 2006, John Tucker Must Die, an adaptation of William Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor. And finally, in 2010, Easy A, a film that took creative inspiration from Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Who was the director of Easy A? A man named Will Gluck. Why does that name sound familiar? Oh right, I already mentioned him because he's the director of anyone but you. This is kind of what would happen if we took that Scarlet Letter and updated it into where we, the time period we live in now. But instead of adultery, it's about a young girl's battle with being accused of promiscuity. And is instead of running away from it, like Hester Prynne did in the, in the original, she takes as a badge of honor and claims to be the most promiscuous girl in the, in the town to see how she, her, her uh, uh, status is elevated. And uh, it does get elevated for a time, but then it immediately smacks her in the face as uh, all lies kind of tend to do. Now, 2010 was not the last we would see of the modern literary adaptation, nor was Easy A the swan song of the concept. More or less any tragic or melodramatic love story, anything involving star-crossed lovers will inevitably be compared to Romeo and Juliet, even if the people who wrote the story didn't directly intend the comparison. But there's no denying that this era spanning 15 years or so has left an indelible mark on this generation of viewers. To this day, I have a proclivity for this era of stories, but my interest in seeing its revival is motivated by far more than nostalgia. The modern movie market has been increasingly dominated by copaganda franchises funded and endorsed by the State Department, as well as corporate products that have been manufactured with the hopes of increasing the value of an IP and generating further sales of things like toys or games. Though there may be genuine passion and skilled craftsmanship from various workers hired to work on these types of projects, I will first and foremost see the insidious side of these films existing in the first place and taking up the amount of space that they do to the detriment of stories outside of those corporate concepts. From my point of view, the bad far outweighs the good and the true victor in these scenarios are ultimately mega corporations and the military industrial complex. I don't need any more copaganda action films, nor do I want to see a new movie with superficial first wave feminism messaging. Barbie helps to show girls that they can have jobs, just like men. The feminism is real. Except Mattel actually seems pretty averse to the word feminism. They recently went so far as to say that the new film is not a feminist movie. Huh. Okay. That casts a slightly different light on things with superficial first wave feminism messaging that will encourage impressionable children in the audience to scream at their guardians to buy a bunch of plastic toys that are just going to end up in the belly of a whale. Worried about the horrifying effects of Barbie's plastic bodies on the environment? Well, don't panic. Mattel has produced special environmental activist Barbies, which are partially made from recycled plastics, which means since they've already been partially recycled once, that they can never ever be recycled again and will exist forever. A small sidebar though, if any of you would like to see a really fun action film that has zero propaganda and is instead unapologetically anti-capitalist and pro-environmentalism, watch Meg 2 The Trench. I was not expecting to have as much fun as I did, but I was having the time of my life, especially with that third act. I've seen it twice now. What happened last time? You don't want to know.
One of the things that works out nicely for a lot of these modern literary adaptations is that oftentimes the novels or plays or myths that are used for creative inspiration are old enough that they're in public domain. This clears up a lot of the red tape that can prove to be a hindrance when someone writes a screenplay that requires a newer book's rights to be adapted into a different medium such as film or television. It's also preferable in the grand scheme of things that the main consumerist ripple effect of modern literary adaptations of the classics would be something like encouraging interested viewers to go and buy the book from which the film was originally adapted. The joke's on all of you, mega corporations, because I already have my collection of Shakespeare's completed works. No, oh, because I know you're a fan of Shakespeare. <sighs> More than a fan, we're involved. Circling back to anyone but you, if these two characters are really named Ben and B, that alone should have been a clue that it was a Much Ado About Nothing reference since the two main characters of that play are named Benedict and Beatrice. And yes, you heard me correctly, it's Benedict. Benedict. Been a dick. Yeah, that tracks. Since the plot synopsis states that these two are going to a destination wedding in Australia, I would guess that those two characters who are having the wedding will be the story's stand-ins for Hero and Claudio. What I really want to know is which character Dermot Mulroney will be playing. Daddy? I have an awful sinking feeling it'll be someone like Leonato when I would much rather see him as Don Pedro, who, if you're not familiar with the play, is basically a hot man who spends much of his time in the story playing matchmaker. Denzel Washington played him in the Kenneth Branagh version, and maybe that's why I consider the character to be hot in the first place. Trying to speculate on how this modern adaptation might play out, I would imagine there would be a considerable amount of creative liberties taken. The play has among other things, a bit too much emphasis and investment in purity culture, which is of course very much a result of it being a product of its time. There's this whole dramatic turn of events where Don John, who is Don Pedro's brother, concocts a scheme to make Claudio break off his engagement with Hero because he is led to believe that she was sleeping with another man. Claudio gets really angry when he sees a man hooking up with a woman he believes to be Hero, and he gets super aggro on their wedding day and violently dumps her at the altar. And I really need to emphasize that it's not just the infidelity he's mad about, it's the presumed loss of Hero's virginity. That's gross. I know, it gives me the ick. But here's the thing about Shakespeare. This is by no means the first time his works have aged like milk, or they've just aged naturally, as is bound to happen when a story is several centuries old. One of my favorite modern literary adaptations is 10 Things I Hate About You. It's based on The Taming of the Shrew. If you haven't read The Taming of the Shrew, I cannot emphasize enough how much I dislike it, because in the play, the whole reason the main couple gets together is because he abuses her into submission. He tames her, so to speak. It's garbage. It took me several years of being a fan of the film to finally get around to reading the play, and the play was just as bad, if not worse, than I anticipated. Having said that though, I don't believe that the sole purpose of the modern literary adaptation is to declaw the uglier parts of an old story. The point is that art is and always has been referential. Art inspires the creation of new art. Stories survived for centuries before the film medium existed simply by being told and retold. For as much as Shakespeare is treated as a pinnacle of storytelling and of being one of the main go-to sources of creative inspiration for modern literary adaptations or just literary adaptations in general, even he pulled from pre-existing stories when he wrote. When I was watching The North Man for the first time, I was wondering why the story felt so familiar. And as it turns out, Hamlet, the protagonist of that story, is the direct inspiration for William Shakespeare's Hamlet. I previously referenced Pygmalion, the George Bernard Shaw play, as the inspiration for She's All That. Well, Pygmalion was also a figure of ancient Greek mythology, and his story was one in which he fell in love with a statue he carved. 
Another film I mentioned earlier, Moulin Rouge, has even more creative inspirations than the ones I listed, as Baz Luhrmann has said that he also drew inspiration from the Greek tragedy of Orpheus and Eurydice. I'm trying to not get overly anticipatory about anyone but you, because sometimes my overly high expectations of a film sets it up for failure when I actually see it because it can't reach the levels I've built up in my head. I haven't seen anyone but you. I haven't even seen a trailer. There's a fair few paparazzi photos drifting around online from when it was filming, but apart from that, I'm mostly going off of the film's premise and my long-standing adoration of modern literary adaptations on film. Having said that though, I'm hopeful, considering that Will Gluck has experience with doing a modern literary adaptation with Easy A, which is a film that has the type of playful humor and outlandish antics I like to see in rom-coms. I found an interview he did back during the release of Easy A about the film in which he was asked, what you've done is to take something that's well-worn and tell it in a new way. What does that challenge look like to you? Will Gluck's response was, I think of that old adage, there's only six stories to tell. So as long as the people telling the story acknowledge that the story has been told before, I think people are much more accepting of it. So with this one, I really hit it on the head that the characters know they're going through a story, know that this idea has been in literature and movies before, and are embracing it. I think it lets the audience off the hook. The characters know this isn't brand new material here. Let's just see how they do it. That to me is the right approach and attitude to have about doing a modern literary adaptation. He doesn't actually see Easy A as as much of a literary adaptation, and I do understand why he feels that way, but I think that even by having the themes of the movie and the book run parallel to one another in some way, and having the protagonist Olive be reading the book during the story and using it as an inspiration for how she deals with the negative backlash of a misogynistic puritanical culture, all of that is sufficient enough for me to still class it into a movie playlist of modern literary adaptations. I bought the Scarlet Letter, went down to the bookstore, came back home, brought it home, and my wife said to me, you know we have like five copies of that, and that's one of those books that it's on everyone's bookshelf, but no one reads. So I started to read it, and I did, I did, I said I have to read this, so I did, I got through the entire Scarlet Letter, and it's very, very thick, but it's, it's, a, it's a great book, and uh, what, what was happening back then in the 1600s is happening now, but in different ways. Nothing has changed. And we kind of put that in the Scarlet Letter scenes with Thomas Hayden Church is teaching the book to Emma Stone in her class uh, to kind of talk about how nothing changes over the years. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned the timeline of having these modern literary adaptations that were animated kids films, which preceded a wealth of modern literary adaptations that were films which largely targeted a teenage or young adult audience and oftentimes had protagonists in high school. Well, Anyone But You is a modern literary adaptation with adult protagonists with, yes, an R rating. For as much as I might feel tempted to poke fun at Glenn Powell for his word choice, this actually bodes really well. Some of my favorite films of 2023 so far have been R-rated comedies that have that nostalgic feeling for millennials who grew up in this golden age of teen comedies and rom-coms, several of which happen to be modern literary adaptations. Anyone But You has the right ingredients to follow that audience and tap into their pop culture, media, and emotional references. And the R rating specifically is important because it liberates the story from having to unnecessarily censor itself to bend to the whims of a puritanical red scare system that only exists as the hollow death rattle of the Hayes Code. Yes, that's what the MPA is. It is simply the Hayes Code under a different name and I think it needs to be abolished entirely in favor of a completely new system being created. But that's a rant for another day. If you let the story be R-rated, it can resonate as being more authentic to the audience who fell in love with that golden era of modern literary adaptations because that audience is now made up of adults. 
When I saw No Hard Feelings on opening weekend, it was an audience full of millennials laughing at all the jokes and having the time of their lives. I also think that Glenn Powell is a really good choice for a rom-com lead because Set It Up is a clear standout among the largely abysmal lineup of Netflix original rom-coms. He is very good at comedy. I really only like him when he's performing comedy. I hope that this film gives Glenn some really good physical comedy, a bit like Kenneth Branagh in the 1993 Much Ado About Nothing when he's wrestling with the chair. It's simple but effective and it makes me laugh when I watch it. I don't currently have a strong opinion about Sydney Sweeney being a rom-com lead simply because I personally haven't seen her in a rom-com before, but if she and Glenn got along well, hopefully that means that the chemistry is good and they will be able to deliver some quality bickering on screen, which is essential for Benedict and Beatrice. Are you yet living? Is it possible Disdain should die while she had such meat food to feed it as Senior Benedict? I'm just scoot on over and let you whack him. Get him again. Get him for me. Ah. I had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. I have a thing about feminine rage. I'm very happy that Dermot Mulroney is in this. That man is a rom-com legend. The Wedding Date is one of the most underrated rom-coms of all time. That movie needs to permeate the cultural zeitgeist far more than it currently has. And remember, what an incredible woman you are. Teach him a little wax on wax that ass. And I also hope that Anyone But You includes at least one or two line references from the play. I really love when modern literary adaptations quote the source material. It's one of my favorite types of Easter eggs. I burn, I pine, I perish. Of course you do. Be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great. Some achieve greatness. And some have greatness thrust upon them. Who could refrain that had a heart to love? And in that heart, courage to make love known. Earlier this year, I heavily pursued being able to cover a new film that was coming out solely because Andy Fickman was directing it and I wanted to see if I could get to interview him, and I did. And that was so much fun for me, specifically because Andy Fickman directed She's the Man. And although much of our conversation was, of course, about the new project, I was able to work in one question, a self-indulgent one, about She's the Man. And one of the things he said that stood out to me about why he believed that film is still so beloved after all these years was that the people who worked on She's the Man did collective work on reading and understanding Twelfth Night early on in the production process. And Shakespeare, that guy kind of knew what he was doing. Whether <laughs> it was a guy or a girl or whoever was Shakespeare, Shakespeare wrote a remarkable story that is so well-crafted that all we had to do was do it. Matter of fact, when we first got to rehearsal in Vancouver, the first thing we did was focus on Twelfth Night. Uh, everyone had that script. We watched Twelfth Night movies. We embrace Twelfth Night before we even started working on She's the Man. Much Ado About Nothing has plenty of lines to choose from. The whole sigh no more thing is an obvious but nonetheless acceptable choice. But even if it's just your version of Claudio and Hero doing their wedding vows in Australia saying, I do love nothing in the world so well as you, is not that strange? I will happily take that, even if it's technically not the right character to be saying that line. Contemporary wedding vows would make sense logistically as an acceptable situation to slip in more fancy sounding Shakespearean language without confusing the people in the audience who haven't read the play, nor do they even know that the film is based on a Shakespeare play. You could also use, lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give away myself for you and dote upon the exchange. Have your Claudio say that in his wedding vows so I can get the little adrenaline rush of picking up the reference. There's another line for Much Ado About Nothing that goes, will it serve for any model to build mischief on? 
And that is such a fitting line to sum up the whole approach to both selecting a classic and the adaptation process for bringing a classic story to a modern audience in this genre that sits somewhere between straight up comedy and romantic comedy. For these movies to work, you really do need to have fun with them, embrace the mischief, the mayhem, the shenanigans, but not so far to the point of losing the heart of the story. The audience needs to love the story and the characters for it to truly stay with them emotionally so that decades onward they get on YouTube because they feel compelled to make a whole video essay about the concept. I don't know if anyone but you will be a good movie. I haven't seen it. Like I said, the trailer has not even been released yet. Sony Pictures has no idea who I am or the fact that I'm putting this video together in an attempt to manifest a successful box office turnout for anyone but you. But if you do work for Sony, give me a press screener for anyone but you and let me review it, please. I'm so serious. I've already been following the ongoings for anyone but you when you've got less than 2,000 followers on Instagram and only 150 followers on Twitter. Believe me, I'm dialed in. You have my attention. At the time of making this video, anyone but you is listed as being released in December. But to that, I say... You cannot release this without your actors being available to promote. It's a rom-com and it needs its leads to frolic around being cute, to sell the concept to a casual movie going audience. That's how this works. So to the industry higher ups, I will reiterate, let go of your desperate parasitic greed and pay your workers fair wages, their fair share of the profits generated by their labor, and give them safe and humane working conditions. If the workers aren't granted these things soon-ish, I would imagine this will get delayed the way many other films already have, but either way, I feel like I should say the quiet part out loud. Why are you releasing a destination rom-com in December? February is right there. That's peak Galentine's Day season. That was a top night. Top night. <laughs> but whenever it does come out, I will be there opening weekend because I want to send a message, no matter how small it is in the grand scheme of things, to the corporate higher ups that the audience wants more rom-coms and modern literary adaptations for the culture of good vibes, fun, non-mega corporation IP stories, as well as the rejection of copaganda. Watch me say that now, and then they're going to reveal that they've made Benedict a cop, and I will just be filled with rage. Cunt. What are your favorite rom-coms or your favorite modern literary adaptations? Let me know in the comments. Like, comment, and subscribe for more unsolicited opinions about films and storytelling. And also feel free to join my Patreon for bonus material. Bye. Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict? I did never think that lady would have loved any man. Yo, it's not funny. It's really not funny. <laughs> I just think that Glenn Powell could be the new Matthew McConaughey if Hollywood finally realizes that Glenn Powell is best suited to do more rom-coms and comedies in general. Matthew McConaughey used to be all over my radar when he was Mr. Rom-Com and the star of Ed TV, but now he wants to do all these serious dramas and I just, I don't know him anymore. What the hell is... Ooh, y'all are really testing me on some stuff that I... I hate to say it, I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street, I wouldn't... I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man. Oh, 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 are you okay? Are you okay? Hey, I love him! I, love him. I know I know him, y'all! I just, know just him. him! What is it? I'm in the middle of recording and you decided that you'd like to scream at the audience. Do you have something you'd like to say? No.